Ooh. <laughs> All right, best behavior, everyone. <laughs> All right, um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stacy Branham, who is an assistant professor in informatics at the University of California at Irvine. And she is going to tell us today about moving marginalized people from other to expert in technology design. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good. Is it still morning? <laughs> good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on a, on a lazy Friday. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, but if you did have to circle the speaker who doesn't belong in this series, it might be me. Um, I'm very, very um, human centered, as you'll see throughout the talk, but I'm excited to be here. I do enjoy kind of reaching across um, communities uh, in order to find really interesting common grounds in the middle. Um, so literally when Satish sent me the email inviting me to, to give a talk, I kind of like looked around my office and was like, who me? <laughs> because um, I, am, I am now an assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine in the Department of Informatics, which I, um, I gather is very different than the informatics uh, uh, group that you have here, which is very systems focused. We have folks who, some of whom are, are software engineers, but um, people who are focusing on learning and games um, and esports, people who are focusing on um, on science, technology, and society, on technology and organizations, like a business kind of uh, perspective. And you have people like me. I am a human-centered computing, human-computer interaction uh, person who designs technologies uh, within for people with disabilities. So, um, so yeah, here's the disclaimer. Uh, I have a background in computer science. Um, uh, however, I'm a re I consider myself a recovering computer scientist, um, and that I really got excited about the social sciences too. Um, so uh, the way one way to put that is I'm a critical computer scientist. So I still build things. Um, usually in collaboration with companies who give me large chunks of money. I really like those. Um, or with undergraduate students who want to do the building with me. Um, but I also consider myself a designer and somebody who critiques the role of technology in society. So you're going to see a lot of critique in, um, in this presentation. Uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the projects I've done in the past that I'll be drawing examples from during this talk, uh, I was co-PI in a grant a couple years ago when I was a lecturer at UMBC um, that was funded by Toyota to create uh, this device you see here called Blade. Okay, it's a wearable device with cameras, um, with, uh, with haptic uh, feedback, with audio input and output, and it's supposed to help people who are blind identify key features within a room to help them navigate places like, oh, there's an exit sign over there, so it's using computer vision, and it actually helps you orient by just explaining that the exit sign is at one o'clock. Um, so in any event, we, we designed and they came to a, a full functioning prototype of that. Um, and we've done a number of studies about the social acceptability of wearing something like that or someone who's blind and how useful it is, what features should or shouldn't be there, et cetera. So that's one project with Toyota. And another ongoing project in uh, the same kind of realm, navigation technologies for people who are blind is, um, uh, being uh, funded by TRX Systems um, and a Mar the Maryland Industrial Part Partnerships Program that tries to create ties between universities and, sm and small local companies. Um, so anyway, the, the project we're working on with TRX is all about navigating indoors um, with more accurate uh, uh, location data by using beacons and, um, you know, air pressure monitors and um, Wi-Fi signatures, et cetera. So um, they have turn-by-turn -turn routing, not just, oh, there's something at, you know, two or three o'clock, but uh, go, go 10 feet forward and then take a left, and the elevator is going to be about five feet on your right. Um, so anyway, we've been uh, designing these sort of technologies with um, an eye to understanding how they can improve the lives of people from marginalized communities, blind, um, the blind community being one that I particularly enjoy working with, um, and trying to make them better. All right. Oh, the most important thing about the work that I do is that I work with marginalized populations. I don't just work to serve them. Um, so I try to include people uh, from a variety of backgrounds in my research group. This is a set of pictures of 
um, several of the students in my group that I happen to have fancy pictures of. And uh, we have numerous people who are blind that I've recently collaborated with, people who identify as LGBTQ, uh, women in computing, people who are first generation college students, people who are English as a second language learners. I think that diversity is kind of the key to making technologies that um, serve diverse communities. All right. Okay, so this is what I'm going to try to convince you during the talk. Um, I, I feel more and more confident with the things at the front of the list and the thing at the end of the list. That's something that we'll have, I'm sure, some exciting conversations about because it's the newest piece and um, a great chunk of my future work. But the first thing is, um, I'm guessing that we have some people who are artificial intelligence, machine learning people in the audience, yes. Um, I'm guessing that you've heard of some of the ways that AI can harm marginalized communities. Um, and I then wanna talk about how we, uh, at many different scales, society, technology, and my particular field, human-computer interaction, how we're in a sort of diversity crisis um, and ways that we're trying to get out of it by improving our methods so that we make better AI. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna present what I think could be an additional way that we start addressing some of the challenges with creating AI that um, is supportive of people from marginalized communities. Cool? All right, so I'm gonna start with this one. Um, I'm guessing you've seen some of these books before, Weapons of Mass Destruction, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, you know, there are many, many books coming out about how uh, AI can go wrong. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a few examples um, that you've probably also seen in the news. Um, here's a picture on the left of uh, two friends that was tagged by Google Images. Um, they are African-Americans and they were tagged as gorillas. Uh, the second one is um, a, an ad campaign hosted by UN Women, I believe it is. Um, and it shows women in a Google search bar over their mouths and then the auto uh, the autofill options as, as you start to type for, for your auto query. So women shouldn't, and then Google fills it in with uh, have rights, vote, work, box. Um, and then uh, the final one that I have on the page here is um, something a little bit more frivolous and uh, jokey, but, but very recent. A comedian who has a, um, a uh, speech impediment was using Google's or Apple Siri to dictate a, a calendar event. And they wanted to um, say, call radio two, but it was translated into call weighty two. <laughs> and the tweet that this uh, comedian posted was, this is just hurtful. Um, all right, so I would call these in the realm of like microaggressions, right? You know what I mean by microaggressions? Okay, like a kind of a small incident that um, uh, reminds a person that they're from a marginalized community and that they're kind of other, they're not the norm. Um, but I think that these things can be very serious. So here's a few other examples that maybe um, cut a little bit more toward harming one's, um, uh, having a threat to someone's livelihood. So the first example is, um, uh, oh, what is this? Oh, Facebook ads. Facebook's recently been in the news for um, enabling people who are posting housing opportunities through advertisements to um, filter out people by race, gender, uh, age, et cetera, et cetera, d disability status. Um, and so HUD has actually um, sent them uh uh, I don't know if it's a fine or, or whatnot, but it's illegal <laughs> to have this interface. The second example is about um, an algorithm that Amazon was developing to help them automate the process of selecting job candidates and hiring people. And they realized it was almost impossible to uh, take out uh, the gender bias um, because the resumes of people who included things like the women's chess club, uh, the presence of the term women's would actually devalue or lower in rank the quality of the applicants um, in the ultimate ranking. So they pulled the plug on that project. And um, uh, the third example I have here is about um, uh, the Idaho Medicaid uh, program and the algorithm that they had developed to decide how much um, 
uh, like medical coverage that they would have for the year. And it was found in a, in a lawsuit brought by the um, ACLU that this algorithm was um, flawed and uh, unfairly um, lowering by something like 20 to 30 percent the allowed uh, coverage for people with um, with uh, intellectual disabilities. All right, so these are some examples that maybe you can see the kind of first order effects being really challenging to someone's ability to get a job, somebody's ability to buy housing, somebody's ability to um, pay for their their healthcare bills. All right, so this is what I mean by AI can harm marginalized communities. Um, and this is a topic that's become really interesting in my field of human computer interaction. So um, you'll notice that on the past few slides, I've been sorting these examples into race, gender, ability. Certainly, there are other qualities by which these algorithms can be differentiating, like low socioeconomic status, for example. Um, but these are these are topics that I think get I think race gets most of the kind of attention. Um, at least in my field. And gender and ability are two topics that I specifically focus on in my work that I think are um, understudied. They haven't been studied enough, but they're starting to become um, matters of import in the field. Yeah. Yes. This algorithm bias is a very hot topic right now. Yes. Has, uh, had this talk been advertised as about you know, faith, F A T, fairness, accountability. Yes, fairness, that's it. Explainability. This will impact. Oh, gosh, darn it. You know what? Uh, this is partly my fault for um, deciding to readjust the, uh, to readjust. Well, there's a video. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of readjust the, um, the focus of the talk, not to just a bias or, or design for marginalized communities for technology, but specifically artificial intelligence. I don't usually do research, and you'll see this later, that's specifically focused on AI. Um, however, it's been coming up in, in my research on general technology, and so I'll be showing you examples from my work with people who are blind and people who are transgender and how algor algorithmic bias is impacting them. Um, thank you for bringing that up, and I would love to chat after a bit about that. Um, okay, so in my field, we have things like papers like, does technology have race, which is again about algorithmic bias and race. Let's talk about race by Ari Schlesinger um, and her collaborators. Uh, Jen Rode, I think, was the lead on does technology have race. We have um, recent work by Oliver Hameson that's about uh, talking about transgender identity and how that's baked into technology. Um, and finally, uh, we're, we're starting to look at, for example, how uh, fitness trackers exclude people who are wheelchair users, but I don't have steps, says Patrick Carrington in his recent paper. Um, and how, uh, going back to the speech impediments example, how um, uh, speech to text uh, engines do not serve the deaf community well or people with speech impediments. So this is again, like in my fields as well, very, very hot topic. Um, what I, one thing I highlighted across the bottom is a recent paper that's been getting a lot of attention and it's been very impactful at um, our main conference, the SIG Chi conference in 2017 um, called intersectional HCI. Have you guys heard of this term intersectionality? Okay, it's a feminist term about how um, these multiple identities, people who sit at the intersections of them can actually face increased bias or increased sense of um, not being visible or being um, being harmed by uh, policy, et cetera. So um, we're very much interested in not just these various categories, but also how they intersect with one another. Um, all right. So the next part of this section, and this is the, the largest section of my talk, so don't, don't worry, the other two kind of go by pretty quick, but um, I just want to share with you some examples from my research and, and the field studies I've been running with uh, people who are blind, people who are trans over the last three years, and um, examples that I wasn't explicitly necessarily seeking out, but that came up about uh, bias in AI. Um, and the way that I'm going to present them, I thought that I might take a crack. Please, please do let me know how inaccurate this, at, inaccurate this is. But take a crack at organizing the examples by the stage at which um, those biases were introduced in the in the process of developing the algorithm. Was it uh, something that happened in the problem scoping and framing of of the uh, of the design process? Is it something that was about the data sourcing? Um, and then I kind of black box all this stuff in between data cleaning and selecting, 
uh, data pre-processing, model selection and training, and jump down to deployment. Because again, as a user-centered kind of uh, person, inputs and outputs are my specialty and not a lot about what's happening under the hood. But um, I do think that we should inspect those processes too. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples that I think are happening at each of these stages. Um, the first example, it's something uh, that I think is about the problem scoping and framing. And I'm going to share some uh, information about or, or, or a story about um, work I'm doing on conversational agents. Think Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and how um, how these systems, uh, their models don't fully incorporate uh, people who are blind, who are expert screen reader users. Okay, and I'm going to show you a video. Do you know what I mean by screen reader? Right? Um, wonderful. I see some nods in the audience. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, essentially, it's because you know, 2D, 2D monitors like this are not accessible to a person who's blind or low vision. Um, essentially, the content on the page becomes linearized into text and is read out loud uh, through a speaker. And then you can interact with that through, uh, you know, through typing on your keyboard, through gestures on your phone, and now through voice input, um, which is fantastic. Now, I'm going to show you um, an example of how my blind PhD student, his name is Ali Abdurrahmani, uh, at UMBC, how he gets the weather two ways as a blind person. Okay. Hey Siri, hey. how is the weather today? It's currently clear and 53 degrees in Catonsville. Expect partly cloudy sky starting in the evening. Temperatures are heading down from 55 degrees this afternoon to 50 tonight. All right, so that was using Siri. All right, so uh, what did you notice about those two different ways? Oops, I think I quit my presentation. Let me bring it up again. So what did you notice about those two different ways of interacting with uh, the weather app? The first was um, through Siri, and the second was through voiceover. Yeah. So Siri was much more natural. Siri was much more natural language, right? Exactly. And then, um, what else did we notice about the second one? Very fast. You say it's too fast to understand. My uh, PhD student, Ali, would say, I beg to differ. That is exactly how fast it needs to be for me to get things done. <laughs> and actually, Ali is not, um, he identifies himself as a kind of a sub expert at screen reader users. Uh, he, he uses his at like 60 to 70%, I think, but other people who are blind who I'm uh, familiar with, they use jack it up to 100 and they say, that's not fast enough. Um, so they're very skilled at listening to this very fast. All right, I think I finally have my slides back up here. So my point is, I have a I have a master's thesis student who's looking at all the design guidelines across these various uh, conversational agent platforms, and he's finding that the general assumption upon which these are built is that you have some sort of human-human interaction paradigm, um, and they're actually building on converse, like linguistic models um, cooperative uh, uh, communication models, for example, about how you should be able to speak and how you should be responded to um, in interactions with these conversational agents. But what those don't really incorporate is um, what if you're a person who's blind? This might be the only interface you can use to get access to that tool. And you want to do some seriously productive work here. I don't just want to play my music. I want to do like word processing. I want to write a multi paragraph text message and I want to be able to edit the errors and I want to do it in a fast way. Um, so, long story short, what we're finding is that there are a number of mismatches between the model that's being used to develop the systems and some of the preferences of people who are blind who um, who have different needs. Two of them that I highlight here are um, that you know some of our many of our participants thought these interfaces are way too verbose. I don't need to hear 17 seconds of the weather. I want to be able to like skip forward, skip back and hear things really quickly, adjust the, the verbosity but also the speed of the voice. 
Um, and that's something that we have published in a recent paper at Assets called Siri Talks at You. And we have a, a poster paper, my students, uh, master's thesis students first poster paper at the iConference being presented about um, how we should expand our models that we can draw from to create these conversational agents. Okay, so that's the first example. The second example I have for um, problem scoping and framing is, is about automatic gender recognition systems um, and specifically how they might impact the transgender community. Um, this is work that uh, was published recently at CHI uh, 2018, and we are very proud that it won um, a best paper um, award um, at that community. And it's all about how um, automatic gender recognition systems, these are systems that might um, draw on your facial shape or even the shape of your chest, um, maybe your, your, your voice, maybe um, the clothes you're wearing or combinations of these in order to try to identify your gender. Um, and what we did is we talked in interviews to people who identify as transgender and people who identify as transgender technologists, and we got their feedback about these types of systems and how they're currently being used and what sorts of research trajectories are being explored. And um, the basics, uh, one very kind of uh, common thing we heard from this community is, uh, I don't know if this automatic gender recognition thing would intersect well with transness. It sounds like it could be a bit bioessentialist, meaning kind of reducing the, the, the notion of gender to simply like physical sexual uh, parts, um, rather than what most trans people would understand gender to be a kind of cultural production of, um, of, of gender. And so one thing that we're noticing is that the models of these systems that assume that, that you're male or female, um, or you're male, female, or other, which is almost worse, you never want to be just an other, um, that they just completely miss the mark because, uh, what is it, Facebook now has like 50 different varieties of gender that you can self-identify as plus a fill in the blank. Um, and uh, not only is gender not binary to this user group, gender is dynamic. I mean, the way that I feel today may be different from the way I feel tomorrow. Um, and uh, so gender is something that's kind of fluid. And then finally, gender is private. And I don't mean that as like a, uh, I don't want you to know my gender, which it can be, but I mean it more in like a Wittgensteinian sense of like, it's something that's unknown to external people. It's inside of me. It's not a thing that you can ascertain just from looking at me or even talking with me. Um, they would say gender is, uh, is, is detached from that and separate. And that's especially the case for somebody who has not transitioned, for example, because the way that people might read who I am and what my gender is, is uh, very different from what I actually feel inside. Um, so the model, the model is a mismatch for this community. Okay, the third example I have is about the data sourcing. Okay, where do we get the data to train up our algorithms so that we have, um, you know, more reliable results? Uh, so this is again an example from working with the transgender community, um, and uh, what happened is a researcher um, and his graduate student in 2013 <laughs> were interested in exploring um, whether an algorithm could detect uh, gender transition, whether you know a person has gone through transition if you can look at pictures from two different times in their life. Um, and the rationale for why they were doing this was a kind of a, a national security rationale. Oh, what if there's a terrorist who's going through some sort of airport and they're trying to disguise themselves as a different gender? How can we automatically detect that? Um, I, I don't comprehend the rationale there. It seems a little bit bogus, but that's the rationale. And um, then they went and they gathered um, over 200 videos from YouTube um, that, that were gender transition videos where people had gone through, were, had gone through or were going through hormone replacement therapy and um, sharing that with the world. And what you'll hear from those individuals about why they put that data in the public is that they, they had a difficult time themselves going through that 
process. Um, and they wanted to be able to facilitate other people's transition to help educate them and make them feel like part of a community, right? Um, and then when they found out that these data had been gathered and that they were now um, uh, centralized and that they were being shared with the academic community and the business community as a resource um, for algorithmic uh, development, they were appalled, scared. Um, and what I have here are not a, uh, are not quotes directly about that particular incident, but quotes that I think are related that came from um, interviews with trans individuals about technology use. So the first one on the left was talking about an incident where um, a trans individual um, found that their name was on a big list of other trans people. And they had no idea how it got there. It got there without their permission. Um, and the reaction was, honestly, it looks like something, the list looks like something that's used for doxing. We're familiar with doxing in the room. Um, so doxing is essentially taking somebody's online identity and matching it up with their offline identity so that you can't, for example, your address or your phone number um, or your workplace so that people can harass you uh, not just online but also physically. Um, so uh, it's honestly, it's something that looks like it's used for doxing, for harassing you physically. And it was pretty fucking scary. Um, so it can be scary if you go and you gather data about people from marginalized populations without their consideration because actually it might have real life um, physical uh, safety you know, uh, uh, implications for them. The other quote I have here um, was about, it was one of many that we have in our paper about how these technologies um, could be leveraged by bad actors or people who wish them harm. And, um, and one of the, these examples was this. You could see in some state like, say, North Carolina, um, who's still, that's still in, insisted on passing bathroom laws, detectors that try and gauge your gender based on your face every time you try to enter a restroom. And so their great concern was, well, gosh, what if this technology can detect that I'm trans or that I have transitioned um, and somehow keep me out? That might be another site for me to not only have access to my preferred bathroom, but also have other people be able to kind of harass me. All right, so my fourth example, and I just have a couple more, um, this jumps all the way across the process of like building uh, your, you know, your algorithm, um, refining your model, um, et cetera, making predictions and doing testing to deployment, okay? When the algorithm is finally out in the world in a way that um, interacts with people in their everyday settings. So, um, this example goes back to this navigation research that I've been doing with people who are blind. We were developing this blade prototype with Toyota um, and trying to understand what happens, not if, but when this technology makes a mistake. Because, you know, uh, uh, these, these um, image recognition algorithms, they fail at great rates, especially in real life settings where, you know, my lapel is covering the camera halfway or the lighting settings aren't great or like that image is cut in half or someone's in my way. Um, so we asked a number of people about different scenarios in which this technology might fail, um, that it's likely to fail. And we asked them to react to, to um, we asked the blind individuals to react to that. How, what would you do? Uh, how would you feel, et cetera. And one of the scenarios was a false positive scenario where the um, technology identifies a door where there isn't one. And so a person who's blind is like kind of feeling the wall trying to find out where the handle of the door frame is. Um, and uh, that, that's a picture, by the way, on the left of my blind PhD student kind of looking at a wall at a, at a conference that we were at trying to figure out where's the door. Um, and one of our participants says, you know, I would feel a little bit frazzled walking around searching for the door could call attention to myself. So um, one thing I find really compelling about this is that it's not enough just to like try to minimize errors. You need to think about how the errors are going to impact people in their everyday settings. All of a sudden I'm in a public setting and other people are looking at me and I'm reinforcing their idea that blind people are not competent navigators, um, that blind people need help, that they deserve pity, which is the opposite of what most blind people want. Um, 
So a second, um, a second piece of feedback was that a participant was concerned that when the system fails and um, they're left like searching for something that isn't there or going into the wrong restroom or what have you, that someone else might grab their arm. This happens a lot uh, where sighted people think that they're going to come in and be the hero and rescue somebody who's blind who needs help. And what it really is, it's an invasion of private like space. Um, it's jarring and scary to have someone like out of nowhere grab your arm. Um, and it's uh, it's just another one of those potentially microaggressions, but also potential physical safety risk um, to have to be put in a situation where you're vulnerable to more of those types of interactions. All right, um, I think I have one more example, example five. This is again in the deployment phase and it's a, going back to the transgender community. And um, one of the great risks of these technologies is that it can out you. I, I did mention this a couple slides ago about um, the concern about being outed um, and, the, and the ramifications of that. Um, in, in the data collection process. But also, um, one of the examples we, came, we, we encountered in asking trans people about their experiences in online social media platforms is, um, you know, the ads that are being served up to me are very gendered. Um, one person even said, you know what, after I transitioned, I changed my profile uh, gender to a, a different gender, and then the ads that they gave me were so bad, I actually changed it back. <laughs> um, and they were going, they were transitioning from male to female, um, and it was better to misrepresent their gender identity than to have to wit witness those ads. Um, so anyway, in addition to that, another trans person said that they once were, um, you know, some trans people are stealth, meaning that they don't disclose their trans identity to certain, um, social groups. Maybe they're out online in a certain like kind of protected community in a safe space, but in their physical like workplace environment, they don't feel safe being that way. And so they don't disclose their gender identity. The behaviors that they're doing online change what ads are being served up to them. And then when you encounter uh, like a colleague or a friend outside of that context, and they're looking over your shoulder and seeing all sorts of these like feminine products, or maybe um, maybe they're seeing um, uh, clothing ads, maybe they're seeing hormone replacement therapy ads, that could unwittingly out you. Um, and I just wanted to drive home what the what's really at stake when you're outed. Um, and uh, here's a list that we came up with from our study. People were, were concerned about being kicked out of their house because they were still dependent on uh, living with um, others. People were worried about um, being able to get hired, about being harassed by coworkers, um, being fired from their job, uh, having their home vandalized, and being physically or sexually assaulted. Um, and these worries are not unfounded. If you look at the numbers and statistics, which I have, uh, you'll see on the next slide, I've accidentally failed to put in here. It's a really dire situation um, for the tran for transgender community members, especially those who have multiply marginalized identities, like someone who's a black male to female trans person. Um, okay, and another quote that I have here is um, again, just putting into the, the words of a person who's trans just how scary it can be. There are people online who wanna rape or beat up or kill people who are queer. And so if they know where I lived or they found me on the street at night, then they might try that. Okay. So yeah, so he, after my uh, recognition of my glaring omission, I just wanted to point out that um, I'd be happy to talk with you more afterwards about those stats, but there are some great uh, synthesis, uh, syntheses in our um, previous papers that I've been drawing from here, Safe Spaces and Safe Places, which was published at um, CSCW this year, um, uh, Gender Recognition, Gender Reductionism at CHI this year, um, is someone there, do they have a gun? Uh, that was published at Assets last year and Embracing Errors was published at Assets last year. And all of these documents, some of the real life harms that come from the types of um, uh, just interactions with algorithms that I've, I've described in previous slides. Okay. So do you believe me that AI can harm marginalized communities? <laughs> um, it can do great things too, but that's not my like talk today. This is a doom and gloom talk, and we can have like more aspirational features to <laughs> discussions later. 
Um, so the next thing I want to point out is that we're in a diversity crisis. Um, and again, I said like at different levels. Um, one of them is just in the technology community. Uh, I, I see some women in the room, um, and I'm sure there are other um, identities in the audience um, that maybe felt like they didn't belong in computer science. I will say I, I love my alma mater, Virginia Tech, but when I first stepped foot into my um, you know, my intro to data structures class, there were 100 seats and there were three other people who I uh, read as women in the room. Okay, and that that statistic followed me throughout. And by the time I graduated, I uh, graduated in a class of 4.2% women um, in 2007. I'll date myself. So it's not that long ago in the United States of America. Um, and so uh, I got the, the title for this section of the talk from um, Tammy Gebru, um, who I think did a stint at Stanford uh, and did a postdoc up with Microsoft and, and focusing on um, uh, diversity in, in AI. And uh, she says, when I started Black in AI, which is an organization or a, a, a collective that, that she's initiated or co-created, co I started it with a couple of my friends. I had a tiny mailing list before that where I literally would add any Black person I saw in the field into the mailing list and be like, hi, I'm Tan Ni. I'm a Black person number two. <laughs> I'm Black person number two. Hi, Black person number one. Let's be friends. All right, so um, it's clear through so many different metrics that um, that there are challenges with recruiting and keeping uh, people with diverse identities in the tech field. Um, and let's not get into the reasons. There are many, many reasons, and it's a hard problem, and people have been working very hard and earnestly on that for a long time. But uh, uh, I think it's important, Temneet says, diversity is really important in AI, not just in data sets, but also in researchers. Okay, and I, I agree with that. So I actually have for the next two slides, I'm going to inspect the the crisis symptoms of this diversity crisis that I've seen just in the last couple of years in my field, human computer interaction, both professionally and technically. So just in the past couple of years, um, literally two weeks ago, the main organization that uh, it, within the ACM, the largest I think special interest group or SIG, um, of which I'm a part is SIGCHI, and they just created an adjunct chair for inclusion, and they're organizing various, what they call inclusion teams. Um, they have a diversity and inclusion chair and accessibility chairs popping up at multiple conferences. I know because I'm I'm serving in that role for two different conferences. Um, there's now a new diversity and inclusion recognition uh, that the people are applying to make a real ACM award to try to award people who are doing work in these areas. And um, we were very fortunate to get one of those for the paper that was submit, that was accepted to CSCW this year. And um, there, I, I organized a workshop just at the CSCW that was all about, um, it wasn't an official workshop, we called it a lunch shop, but it was all about uh, gender inclusivity guidelines in the works um, for our field. So this is, Again, a very press, uh, a very pressing issue, a very important, uh, vibrant topic today of how to create more diversity within our research communities and in the practitioner community beyond. Um, and technically, um, there have just been a lot of uh, of kind of new research initiatives. Um, that have been popping up. And so what I did kind of informally here is I looked at the series of workshops and I see workshops in the field as kind of representing the next kind of subfields to be launched. And I highlighted all of the workshops at the CSCW conference this year that were focused on um, incorporating marginalized voices in our research um, and not just in our research, but also in artificial intelligence development, machine learning um, development, et cetera. And then on the right, I have a picture of um, a workshop I unfortunately couldn't go to, but it, um, IBM hosted it, Sherry Truen, um, I think organized it uh, back in October, I think, of this year. And it's called AI Fairness for People with Disabilities. And speaking of the FAT community, um, fairness and transparency in AI, uh, we are writing a white paper trying to engage people of that community about specifically um, AI and people with disabilities, AI and fairness and people with disabilities. So it's a hot topic. We realize that there's a bit of a crisis and we're kind of scrambling to address it. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. I think that that'll serve well. Is that good time-wise? Okay, cool. I just want to kind of give you a brief overview of ways that we 
in our field have historically and kind of contemporarily addressed this need for um, increasing diversity in the processes that develop technologies. One is hey, we're the user-centered computing field, the humans, you know, human computer interaction field. We care about real people's needs being um, considered and incorporated during the process of engineering, right? So an example is we just have, we have methods upon methods that do that. We have contextual inquiry, participatory design, scenario-based design, value-centered design. I could go on and on and on. And it's all about including people in the design process somehow. The challenge I think that we've been having with that um, is that we have target users that you incorporate into the process. How do you choose your target users? You know what, I got a degree, a bachelor's degree in computer science from a, a very well-ranked engineering school. And then I got a PhD from that same place. And I still had never thought once about how a blind person uses uh, the technology that I was building. I had licenses to build, and assess technology, and I had never thought about this. So I think the problem is that with the way that we choose our target users, it's very easy to say those people are out of scope for this stage of the, pro the process. We don't need to engage blind people in this. That's something for like iteration in, you know? Um, so I think marginalized people tend to be the last to be evaluated. And one way we know that is that there's flat screens that don't talk to you everywhere you look. You know, blind people had had it made with the command prompt. That's text. Wonderful. Then we went to Windows model. Oh, my gosh. Uh, blind people had it made when there were like physical keys on washer and dryer. And all of a sudden now it's just this fancy flat screen. So we invent technology and then people from marginalized communities tend to be the last uh, the last uh, consideration. Now, number two, we have more and more kind of inclusive models coming up. And those are kind of models that directly say, you know what, we shouldn't wait till the end to try to incorporate marginalized values. We should start from the get-go. So we have things like in the accessibility and gender communities, we have things like universal design. Let's design things that everyone can use and realize that uh, a design that incorporates needs of, of person who's a wheelchair user actually makes the technology work better for everybody. Ability-based design, gender-inclusive design, des des uh, design for social accessibility, which was published by Kristen Shin O'Hara this, this year at Assets. So it's like an ongoing area of development. But I think a real challenge for this approach is that, yeah, you can do that in academia, but how much... Um, how much motivation do people outside of academia who are making the real decisions about what Alexa does, what Siri does, et cetera, are, are going to think in this way? I mean, will the market forces say, yes, it's wise to incorporate, to, to focus this design process on 1% uh, of the population's needs or a half percent of the population's needs? And I don't see that happening. Um, so I do think that there are challenges, but also benefits to that model for being very tailored to the disability or other marginalized communities, if that makes sense. Okay. So yes, please. Question. How do you recognize what the marginalized communities? I mean, is there some oh, nationalist someplace? Oh no, I have no idea. Um, and this is, I would say, a weakness of my work is I haven't really. It's under theorized. I haven't really explored what does it mean to be marginalized. So mean small I think it can mean a number of things. It can mean communities that aren't in positions of power in the context of this talk to influence the design of the technology. Maybe they're not in the room. Maybe they're not the CTO. Yeah, so underrepresented in technology, um, underrepresented in the research field. Um, uh, another one could be um, communities that have systematically been uh, subjugated or discrim discriminated against in society. Um, so I think like a historical view is also warranted about, um, you know, if, if we look at um, the African-American community in America, I think that the net worth of the average African-American household is like $10,000 or something versus the net worth of a, a average white family is like $130,000. Um, and so you can just Im like imagine how that sort of weight on you or like so far behind the starting line can um, can make uh, 
can kind of mount pressures on your ability to get into the technology field, for example, or have a voice in order to impact the next steps of the technology field. Well, that is, yeah, that, that's one of those historical mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. maybe in wheelchair, for example, there's no historical. Uh, oh, yeah. There has been, there has been. So I actually think of the disability um, com community as being like the next civil rights movement. I mean, they've already had a bit of a civil rights movement when they um, did the fun foundational protest to get independent living centers across the country set up for them in which they can take care of each other and have choices over where they live and how they live rather than just being institutionalized by the state and not having their own independence. Um, and the ADA, like that is an, a direct outcome of the protests that actually started at Berkeley back in the, gosh, I think it was the 60s, around the time of the you know, uh, racial civil rights movement in America. Um, and that created like public infrastructures. It said, well, it, it kicked off a number of other additional um, policies that we now have in, in the United States that say, you know, if it's a government website, it has to be screen reader accessible for people who are blind. If it's a public building, the doors have to be at least 32 inches wide or whatever so that a wheelchair can make it through. You've got to have an accessible ramp. So um, so I would con I would consider the disabilities community to also be among those who have historical. Ask, asking questions. And so, so yeah, a, a definition. A definition or something. All that right. That's not to recognize when. Yeah. Not only like, you know, you're harming by excluding from the consideration. Yes. yes, thank you for that. I think that you're absolutely right. And uh, let's do that in version two of my talk. <laughs> and in conversation with others. So um, really briefly, one way out, I think, could be to start acknowledging, uh, and what, what I mean by one way out, by the way, is, is not um, that this is the solution. I think it's an additional complementary solution to the others that might be valuable um, and address this kind of problem with market forces, is that we can recognize the expertise of various groups who tend not to be at the table. Um, so for example, people who are blind, um, my, my blind PhD student says, we're expert voice user interface users. <laughs> That's a mouthful. We're expert at using voice interfaces because literally for about seven hours a day, my student is listening to voice come out of his devices. And he's um, sometimes talking back to them and uh, other times interacting through other modalities um, to get them data. And um, he says, it's almost like this is the most, this voice interface that I now have with um, Alexa or Google Assistant, that's the natural mode of communication for me. Um, and yet, like I, the things that, I, the strategies I have and I know about are not being included in there. Um, why might I not be someone who's sitting at the table as a recognized expert in this area to help create a set of features that enable the sighted people who maybe think that this text is way too fast to understand to maybe give them some place to grow, give them some place in the interface where they can decide, you know what, I do want to up my speed a little bit because I got I'm busy. <laughs> and oh, now that I see these extra features in the interface that help me write longer text messages, that's actually the easier thing for me to do while I'm on the go. So he's interested in kind of um, being uh, recognizing blind individuals um, value as expert users and maybe bringing them into the design process up front um, as like a power, an example of a power user rather than last. <laughs> um, and because I think we're running out of time, I'm gonna skip over this example about um, trans users. And um, I'll also skip over how I'm I think I'm implementing this idea in my current laboratory. Um, and it's uh, certainly future work to try to understand whether or not these, this grand claim I'm making has any empirical uh, um, uh, a justification. <laughs> um, so uh, the last thing I'll say is what does this mean for us, like for the people in the room? I think, um, I think it might mean, oh, well, maybe you would bring some marginalized experts in the lab. If you're trying to understand how to create like conversational agents, um, maybe you would bring in someone who's a screen reader user. Um, I think it could also be an opportunity for collaborations. 
like someone like me might be someone who would be a valuable member on the team um, and we could complement each other with your understanding of what's happening in the black box and my understanding of various marginalized communities. Maybe there's some new funding opportunities that will be accessible if you're doing this kind of different and more inclusive approach to developing um, your algorithms. Um, uh, I mentioned back here uh, in my slides, I can explain what this means later, but they're, um, one of the great outcomes of the ADA is curb cuts, <laughs> those little cuts in the curb that allow you to roll your stroller and your skateboard and your wheelchair um, up and down from the street. Um, like what would the digital equivalent, equivalent of that be? And maybe, maybe you're not finding it because you don't have the right voices in the room who are gonna give you that creative perspective. Um, Maybe it'll help you build stronger systems. Maybe it'll enhance ethical practice. Uh, and maybe it would reduce the likelihood of being an example in one of my talks in the future of, um, of an algorithm that didn't foresee um, a, a great injustice that it might do to a marginalized community that you've never met before and that I've never met before. Um, so anyway, those are just some thoughts. I put a question mark at the end of those because I actually don't know. And I think that this is something for discussion um, and exploration. And that's the great excitement of uh, what lies ahead. So um, with that, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming today and for listening to my um, This Speaker Does Not Belong talk. And I would like to thank my um, current and past funders and collaborators. And um, I'm so excited to talk with you all. <laughs> So we are well within time. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Some, some ideas. Yeah. To answer to some of these questions, yeah. Know, specifically for like, as for AI people, uh -huh. now many of them have to deal with just training data, yeah. originating training data. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The algorithms, like, you know, you know, trying to increase precision recall, all these metrics that they're dealing with the microscopically trying at the macro level, trying to optimize something that okay. might end up being discriminatory or unfair or whatever to small subpopulations. Okay. Solutions? I, I only or understood I only understood half of that, but I think that that means that part of the solution is um, more people who are sitting at the intersection of you and me who can understand that language and then try to um, translate it with their access to people. So that's part of it. Um, then the second thing is, um, I think just, uh, lots of things don't work. Lots of things don't work well. And, um, and the way that they end up working is just through human human collaboration and understanding and care. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, the washer and dryer aren't accessible for example, but um, maybe if I'm um, blind, I have a like a kind of a deal with my partner that, okay, you get it started and I'll take it out and fold or something like this. And so we come up with these like human workarounds all the time, this like duct tape, social duct tape, if you will, to fix the technical issues. And I think the thing that really will upset someone is if they don't know that the um, inaccessible thing is coming or that thing was made without any consultation of them and it like completely ruined the system that they had that was working in the past. So again, like this example of like flat screens pervading life now, um, even though they're not so great for a lot of populations. So I really think one of the solutions is social and kind of political in just bringing people into the decision-making process. And if they feel like their voice has been heard, like, Oh, I see why you're making it a touch screen. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe that's the, maybe that's a fine trade off. And maybe here's some workarounds I can do. Oh, but maybe if you just put like a beep in there for me or like a tactile feedback, that would be cool too. You know, having people at the table and having those conversations, it's okay if you make a gaffe a little bit more if the people who um, are harmed were involved in the process and are continually involved in the process to make it better. Google had some black engineers who were able to avoid the gorilla search 
<laughs> I actually do think in some cases, yes. Like for what, another example that I almost plugged in there was the example of the um, auto detect faucets. You know how you like walk up to a faucet and you wave your hands. Um, but there was a systematic problem in one of those where like black hands weren't recognized. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think like, well, if you had black engineers on the team, you know how you eat your own dog food in engineering teams? They probably would have found that. Um, they have different concerns, just like when I'm watching a movie with my husband and um, my husband's like a Korean American. And so he'll notice a lot of like, like little racist microaggressions in movies. And I'll notice all the sexist ones. And together we've got like, you know, those two, those two things covered. <laughs> And so the diversity in the room is that you have, the value of that is you have people looking from different angles and noticing holes. Um, you're not gonna catch all of them because there's 7 billion people in this world, but uh, it can be better, I think better, with, with different, with, with more variety in the room. More eyes. Yeah, I think so. And more like, like open conversation and engagement. Hmm. Other thoughts? Uh, also, you're wonderful. Uh, you're my MVP. <laughs> but what about the unintended consequences of, uh, of if suppose everything you're talking about does come to fruition and life is just so easy for everybody, you know? It's impossible. Um, it's impossible. What about the unintended consequences? Because I do think uh, that what right. you call microaggressions or small challenges that would yeah. make room build strong built. people that are able to handle. Oh, right, right, right. Um, they so, can. So you're actually going to be, you know, making it easy. Oh, that's that goes back to the. And now I'm really like freewheeling, and this is out of my area of, of of understanding, but I should learn more about it. But my sense is that um, I'm willing to, uh, I'm willing to, I'm able to weather those much better if I'm in a in a position of strength in other ways. Like if I'm somebody who has access to healthcare, if I'm somebody who has a place to sleep at night and I'm not worried that walking down the street might get me killed, um, then uh, then I think I'm able to better weather those microaggressions. They mean less, they roll off of me. And so I actually think, um, you know, for me, there's some things that just can't be called a microaggression because I am a, a wealthy white woman. Uh, and so I think that, the, that uh, a healthier society in general will allow us to kind of be more forgiving of each other if we're a little bit more like, um, equitable in terms of our real resources to be safe and healthy. I can actually venture the flip side. I think actually the women probably in this excluded field, they're probably actually not from comfortable, so they can not really comfortable background. They're probably coming from oh, lower class. In AI? In AI, in any exclusion in the field, and this is my <sighs> hypothesis, I haven't tested it, but I think it's this because being yeah. from like underprivileged sort of an under, otherwise underprivileged backgrounds have made them more resilient being yes. able to, you know, yeah. you think comfort makes it, I think the opposite actually. So that's uh, so true. Sometimes I think, you know, uh, uh, adversity is yeah. not a bad thing. Um, yeah. As long as it's not a <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's, oh. Can but we get wine over lunch? <laughs> let's, that's a really that's a really interesting thought, and I'd love to chat about it with like more anecdotes uh, off the camera. <laughs> hey, did you have a question as well? Yeah, I wanted to ask about agency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, I think it's not clear to me what is the problem with bringing engineers to that table. Mm. So you seem to correctly argue that the problem is finding good ways of organizing them. Is the is it? Let me see if I can rephrase this and correct me um, on what I'm missing. It's like we're just trying to see if conversational agents are even like gonna stand. Like if we can even make them work, it's not necessarily the time to like no. hold it up to these higher standards. Oh, no, no, no. That's okay, like, oh, sorry. Exactly the opposite. Ah! But, I mean, <laughs> but I think it's like, um, I would say that nowadays, uh, interactive conversation is a little bit underwhelming. Like, um, 
I personally find Siri through verbal too. Like I never actually use it because it takes so much time. Yeah. And I know of many researchers who are currently involved in trying to make it better so that people actually use it. Yeah. And um, it's like I can see Lisanna really clear too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Microaggression, <laughs> potentially. So yeah. yeah, I was saying that I can actually see a lot of opportunities for experts. Yeah. Oh, I totally do. Um, I think one of the arguments we're going to try to make once my master's thesis student finishes the analysis and gets a gets this um, published about like how these different design guidelines. Um, what they're generally recommending and generally not is that they're, I think that they're recommending one kind of persona or one kind of relationship. Like this is the sort of relationship that the speaker and the agent have together. Whereas um, I think Malcolm Gladwell has this, this YouTube video where he talks about um, how uh, this is going to be, um, this is going to not be well explained because I listened to this like a, 10 years ago, but uh, basically, the solution to making the best um, the best uh, tomato sauce for spaghetti was not just coming up with the ultimate like um, grand theory of the best tomato sauce recipe ever. It was having varieties so that people could self-identify as like, well, I'm really kind of like a, a tomato basil kind of base person and oh, I really want the mushrooms in there. And, and you're kind of having a variety of options that people can kind of fit into because there's a variety of people. Um, I think then that there needs to be a variety of um, conversational agent and user interaction kind of recipes or um, or models or like uh, paired personas or whatever you want to call them. And what right now what we're missing is there's kind of the like, I'm the novice user. I don't know what the commands are. And I don't want to memorize them. That's what we got. Um, and I want to have a naturalistic conversation. But, you know, blind users are like, I'm a power user. I can memorize a lot. I want to create, I want to like pimp this right out. And I want to have some really cool voice macros so I can really efficiently like program this thing to work the way I want it to. Um, I want it to be fast. I want it to be intense. Uh, I want to do, I want to access all of my apps through this one centralized interface because every time they update the Facebook app, it becomes inaccessible. So why would I even go to that? I just want to use this as my, as my like intermediary layer to access all my other apps. You know, so we're, we're, we need to find multiple kind of, um, recipes for how agents and people would interact. I think that was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's my student's PhD. <laughs> so I hope so. And I hope someone funds me and maybe we can work together. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Oh, this was a different talk from what I expected. Yeah. This was a very interesting. I'm so delighted. Um, tell me your name. I'm Christina Lerman. Christina, nice to meet you. Oh, so, so I'm working actually with Homa and actually with Annie as well. But oh, thanks for coming. We are completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah it's yeah, a similar yeah, yeah. problem, but more like, you know, how do you actually design fair from the point of view of, like, you know, can they make robust predictions? Well, but I think the problem, for example, like what would, it's it's a similar problem. It's not exactly like, you know, fairness against the, but yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. so like we have instrumented nurses in the hospital, actually hospital workers, let's say, uh -huh. to, uh, with uh, Fitbits and other things, but we want to predict, for example, cognitive ability, we want to predict their work performance mm -hmm. uh, from like sensing data. And what we first, we found like, you know, we could actually get really good predictability from Fitbit, mm -hmm. for example, just activity, how much do they walk, you know, was actually predicting right. their cognitive huh. ability. Huh. And then what That's it turned crazy. out would actually, it's actually just because we had the heterogeneous population, we had nurses in the study and lab techs. Cool. Nurses had more education. Yep. They were more credentialed. As part of the job, they had to walk around more. To fit. Yep. And then oh, my mom school. will agree with you. She was a neonatal nurse and she always worried about her shoes. Had to have really good shoes. <laughs> and, but the lab techs, it's much easier, you know, so, so just because of the way our population was distributed, we yeah. had this, like, this trend, which was completely not unexpected. Even, un, not unexpected, it wasn't even there. Oh. Within each population, basically, nurses were just had higher cognitive ability and they walked a lot. Oh, yeah. Lab techs had lower kind of cognitive uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they didn't walk so much. 
but because we have this heterogeneous population, if you just you know just look for a trend over the whole population, it looks like there's a trend. Like the more you walk, the smarter right. you are. Right. Which in reality yeah. it was just because of the way population was distributed. That's you know? true. Right. So this type of like biases are in the data basically everywhere. Everywhere you look. Right. At this, something you see a trend, you see something, but it's actually because of the way your population is composed. So you exactly. need to understand your population first before you can. Which is so hard to deal with too, because like it's not really scalable or realistic to get 7 billion people to participate in your study well, or whatever. But, right, so <laughs> that's why we need more automatic methods to, to do that, to yeah. identify the more homogeneous subgroups or okay. something that might be more similar to each other. That's so interesting. And, and I was just wondering, well, you know, this community right now, the fairness and biases in yeah. AI. Uh, I, you know, we're familiar with some of the research, uh -huh. but 